push the push the recording button. We are being recorded. This is for people who miss our sessions or for some reason they want to see it again. And I'll go ahead and say uh, hello again to our, our the people who are here live with us. And I'll also welcome those that are watching the recording. This is how we got the Bible in English. This is our 11th session in the series of how we got the Bible. I'm Paul McLeod, the uh, Minister of Education here at Mount Calvary Baptist uh, Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us. Again, this is what we're going to talk about today is how we got the Bible in English. And uh, as a review, let's just step back for just a moment and let me let you know why we're doing this series again. We're doing this series again called How We Got the Bible so that we can be strengthened, uh, so that we can learn to trust the Bible by, uh, by helping us to understand how the gift of God, uh, how God's gift of the word was transmitted from God to us. So that's my prayer as we go through this series. In the first session, we looked at the Bible and asked ourselves the question, what's so special about the Bible? Uh, and we learned that when the Bible speaks, when scripture speaks, that God speaks. In the next couple sessions, we looked at uh, the question, the Bible has God spoken? Getting to the conclusion of yes, the God has, uh, God has spoken through his word. Uh, and we looked at six evidences. We used our hand and our fist uh, to remind us that the Bible has the stamp of the supernatural. It has the fingerprints of God on it. In session four, we, lay, we took a step back and laid a foundation of uh, 10 key points about the Bible, the most of, important of which is the first one, that the Bible uh, is inspired by God. Once we realize that and we come to grips with that and we actually believe that, a lot of things fall into place. Session five, how we got the Old Testament. We learned that Jesus trusted the Old Testament, and so should we. Session six, how we got the New Testament. Uh, we learned that the testimony of the New Testament is trustworthy. We can rely on the New Testament. In session seven, how the books of the New Testament were chosen. We learned that God created the New Testament canon by inspiring the written words of Christ-commissioned eyewitnesses and their close associates. A few weeks ago in session number eight, we looked at how uh, the New Testament was copied. Uh, God has preserved his word sufficiently for us to recover the message he intended. Now, the last couple of weeks, we took a look at, it was a two-part session. It was a two-part series, uh, sessions nine and 10. Uh, entitled Timeline of the Bible. We looked at an overall chronological overview of how we got the Bible. And I'm hoping that some dots were connected that, and that you got a good overview of, of how we got the Bible. Now, this, uh, this week, we're going to take a look at uh, how we got the Bible in English. We're finally up to how the Bible was written in our native uh, language of English. Those of us whose English uh, is our first language, maybe a couple people have English as second language, but we're finally getting up to, to English. Now, for the last couple of weeks, your personal study has been to do some research, some research on your favorite Bible translation, English Bible translation. And I've solicited some comments from you. And I, I'm curious about what you've learned about your translation of the Bible. You know, some questions like, why do you like it? Where did it come from? What's the source? Was it translated by one person or a committee? Uh, those types of things. And I received an email. It, it was great to see an email from uh, Reverend Howard. Reverend Willie Howard sent me an email. She's been doing some research. And she asked me to uh, read her response, her comment. So the first comment, I'll ask for volunteers here, here in a minute, and you can share your notes. But the first comment that we have is from uh, Reverend Willie Mae Howard. And she writes, one of my favorite, uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, Bible translation is the Good News Bible. 
And she says the beginnings of the Good News Bible can be traced back to a request made by people in Africa and the Far East for a version of the Bible that was easier to read. And this was in 1961. A whole mission board also made a, a request for the same type of translation. Besides these requests, the Good News Bible was born out of the translation theories of linguist uh, Eugene Nida. Uh, that's the name of a, of, a, uh, of a famous linguist, Eugene Nida, the executive secretary of the American Bible Society. So that is what Reverend Willie Mae Howard found, about, found out about one of her favorite translations, the Good News Bible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Willie Mae, for, for wanting to share that with us. We really appreciate that. And uh, it, it's good information about the Good News, about the Good News Bible. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to open it up to, for everyone else. Uh, you can take yourself off a of mute or just pipe up. Uh, what notes do you have on your favorite translation? Go ahead. Okay, I, I got I got one. Um, I like the New King James version. Okay. And um, well, that's the, that's my go-to Bible always. But if I need any type of uh, interpretation or commentary, I would read other commentaries and and other Bibles that's kind of watered down from that version uh, in order to find out exactly what it's trying to tell me if I don't understand it. Um, and uh, it said that the full uh, Bible, New King James Version full Bible was completed in 1982 and it was by Thomas Nelson. Um, the source of translation is from Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, who translated it? Uh, it was 130 scholars, theologians, and pastors. That's why I like that. Um, the goal is to, well, the goal was to update the vocabulary and, and grammar of the New King James Version while preserving the classic style and little, little, literary beauty of the original 1769 King James Version Bible. Um, and the last one is, is close to the original text and it's understandable because it's not the King's English. So that's why I always go to the King James Version, New King James Version. Uh -huh. All right, that sounded like Cynthia. Yeah, okay, that was, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. How did you how did you like doing some research? Was that all new information for you? Uh, that it was uh, it was uh, compiled or translated by 130 scholars, and that was new. I did not know that. I knew it was some some pastors, some theologians mm -hmm. got together to do it, but I didn't know it was like 130. Right. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for that great research, good information. All right, who else has some notes to share? I have a few notes. Mine was, is very much the same as hers. Uh, I also chose the new King James Version. Okay. And the only thing I have different that I did not hear her say is that they worked on it for a total of seven years before mm -hmm. publishing it. I thought that was interesting, seven years to get it together and work and published the entire Bible, but it's my favorite and also because of the beautiful language of the, of the wording of the New King James Version. Okay, thank you, Reverend Tipton. That's good, both of you like the New King James uh, Version. Okay, that's great. Uh, going back to you, Cynthia, uh, just real quick, um, I, I noticed that you used the phrase um, uh, watered down. You said something about uh, other other translations or versions or something something being watered down. What did you mean by that? Yeah, uh, in today's language, uh, in layman's term, what are you trying to tell me? Is what I always ask when I don't really understand what I'm reading. Okay. So if you water it down for me, exactly what are you trying to tell me in a nutshell? Is what I'm looking for. Okay. Okay. 
All right. That that phrase just made my ears go up and I was kind of wondering how you were using that phrase. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Who else, who else has something that they research they want to go ahead and share? Did the NIV, the new international version, that's my go-to. And with my research, it was completely originally translation of the Bible developed by more than 100 scholars working from the best available Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts. The initial version for the project was provided by a single individual, an engineer and working with General Electric in Seattle, Washington by the name of Howard Long. And it says that Howard was a, Long was a lifelong devotee of the King James Version. But when he shared it with his friends, he was distressed to find that it just didn't connect. So Long saw the need for a translation that captured the truths he loved in the language that he contemporary spoke. So he took him 10 years to do it. And then he got a group of uh, people in 1965 to finally do donations for him where he could get it you know, off the ground and they met and decided to do it. Then the self-governed body of 15 biblical scholars, the committee of a Bible translation CBT was formed in charge with the responsibility for the version. And in 1968, the New Bible Society, which subsequently became the International Bible Society, and then Biblical uh, graciously undertook the financial sponsorship of the project. Then it goes on to say a lot of stuff, but it says um, the CBT was charged to meet every year to review, maintain, and strengthen the NIV's ability to accurately and faithfully render God's unchanging word in modern English, and it says the 2011 update to the NIV is the latest fruits of the process by working with the input from pastors and Bible scholars by grappling with the latest discoveries. But they still give credit to Howard Long as being the faithful original inspiration for developing the new international version of the NIV. Right. Okay. Thank you. That was a lot of great information. Yeah, I'd heard that story about Howard Long, about how he was witnessing, how he was evangelizing or talking to someone about sharing, he was sharing Christ and he got out the King James and uh, things didn't go so well because the person couldn't understand it. And so that, that was the start of uh, him wanting to uh, um, have a translation that uh, that could be better understood. So yeah, I'd heard that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's my go-to because to me it's easy to read and to understand. Mm -hmm. So I I like reading it, and I have different versions. I even have a small women's Bible. Uh, it's really unique. I've had it for a long time, and it's called the Women's Devotional, and it's also in the new the NIV. It's the right. NIV version in it. Right. It's okay. just, I think it's easy to understand. And I like it along with that one that uh, Dean was talking about last week. Right. The African Episcopal version of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, the Jubilee edition. Yeah. Oh, the Jubilee edition. Right. Thank you, Z. Appreciate that. You're welcome. I Let's enjoyed the research. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have uh, maybe one more. One more person share with us their research, their notes about their uh, their favorite Bible version. I would just add to what Z has said about the NIV. That's my favorite version, and uh, I was it was interesting to know that it the translation actually went through three different committees. Uh, initially, uh, there was one committee that revived, did the initial translation, the revisions. And then when they finished, then another committee, I guess the general editorial committee, uh, checked in detail what they had done uh, to make sure that it was thorough and that the meaning had not been lost in any of those uh, translations. And then finally, there was a committee 
uh, that did the final version of the NIV. So it right. uh, convinces me that, you know, it was a concerted effort uh, to make sure that it was accurate. And also another goal was to put it in contemporary English translation. And that's why, you know, I, I guess it was the first Bible that I saw uh, after, or that I switched to after the King James Version. Also, uh, a number of study groups use the NIV as their official uh, version of the Bible, and I have just stuck with it uh, as a result of that. Right. Okay, Dr. Williams, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. It, it is so interesting to hear what people's, uh, what, you know, each person's favorite Bible version translation and why it, it, that is so interesting. Now, next week, we are going to jump right into uh, Bible translations. If you notice in your participant guide, this is actually session number six, and it's the last one in our curriculum, in our, in our materials. I've extended this, uh, this particular series by two or three weeks because I wanted you, next week we're going to talk about uh, the different versions, why there's different translations, why do we have all these English translations, uh, and what is, quote, the best translation. Out of all the questions that I receive um, around, um, you know, within, within, uh, within Christianity, within Christian education, uh, Probably the number one question that I'm asked is, Paul, what is the best Bible translation? What is the best version? And, um, and so I'm going to answer that question next week. <laughs> so you'll have, to, you'll have to come next week and find out what is the best uh, Bible translation. Now, some of you already know what the answer is. I think I've shared it with maybe at least a couple of you. Um, so you'll have to come next week to to hear uh, what the best translation is and, and why I think it is. So, but now what we're going to do is we're going to jump into how did, how did the Bible come to be in English? Because up until now, uh, of course, you know that the Old Testament was in Hebrew and Aramaic. You may want to keep that in mind. You can you look on your Bible, your Bible quiz. Let me get my participants guide here. Uh, in, uh, in Aramaic and in Hebrew, mostly in, in Hebrew in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, the original language was Greek, uh, specifically Koine Greek. And then along the way, it was, tra it was uh, translated into whatever was popular uh, in the sphere that the Bible was in at that time. Uh, for example, Syriac uh, and also into other uh, uh, Middle Eastern, uh, some Middle Eastern languages, Persian languages at that time, and then Latin, and then in German, and then finally, now we're going to starting to get into uh, English. Uh, so for our video for today, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, I have to look at his name here, Dr. Timothy Paul Jones, there we go, is going to talk to us about how we got the Bible in English. You can take notes starting on page 78 of your participant guide on page 78. And you also probably want to keep a thumb or a finger uh, on page 12. That's the Bible quid that we're, that we're learning more and more about. And I can tell you that specifically questions number eight and number 10, you're going to hear the answers of those questions from Dr. Jones. So again, you can take notes starting on page 78. And the Bible quiz, you keep your thumb there, uh, starting on page uh, 12. Now, uh, I'd like to remind you that Dr. Jones, Dr. Timothy Jones, he talks fast. But the information that he talks about is... Uh, also in your book, in your handbook, the larger book, which you'll be reading this coming week. So if you don't get every word, if you don't get every point that he's talking about, the major points are in your, in your participant guide, which is good. 
and you're going to be doing some reading this coming week that's going to fill out some information uh, for you. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And like I like to tell you each week or every week that we have a video, you may want to adjust your sound up or down. Um, so I'm not sure how it's going to come out on your end. And I'll probably go ahead and mute everybody just so that we don't have any, any distractions. So here we go with Dr. Timothy Jones. Welcome to session six, where we'll look at the history of the English Bible. Now, of course, you've heard of names like John Wycliffe and William Tyndale, and you've certainly heard of the King James Version of the Bible. But in this session, you're going to learn the story behind each of those names. You're going to learn about a man who was sentenced to death and burned after he was already dead. You're going to learn about a man whose dying prayer was, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And you'll learn about how the King James Version of the Bible resulted from a failed meeting between the King and some of his subjects. <laughs> In 1428, the bones of a dead Bible scholar were dug up, they were burned, and thrown into the River Swift. Now this man had died about 40 years earlier in 1384, and then in 1415, a council of the Roman Catholic Church charged this dead man with more than 200 counts of heresy. And so 13 years later, his bones were burned and his ashes were thrown into a river. The man's name was John Wycliffe. Now, I must admit, if I'm going to be burned, I certainly prefer being burned like John Wycliffe was, after I'm already dead. And yet, at the same time, it's still a bit of an indignity. So what had Wycliffe done to deserve this fate? He was a priest, he was a professor at Oxford at one point. So what did he do to end up being burned after he was already dead? Well, the charges that were brought against him included several different things, including that he denied the power of the Pope and he had a particularly strong view of predestination. But he did something else that certainly did not help his popularity, even though it wasn't the specific charge that was leveled against him after he was dead. And what John Wycliffe had done is he had overseen the translation of the Bible into ordinary English. Now remember Jerome's Latin Vulgate version of the Bible? It was a translation from the fourth and the fifth century. Well, a thousand years separated Jerome's Latin Vulgate from John Wycliffe. Now in that time period, many church leaders began to treat Latin as the only legitimate language for the Bible. The church became especially suspicious of putting the Bible into a language that ordinary people could understand. Because you see, from the perspective of many church leaders, the lay people shouldn't be allowed to hear and to understand what the Bible said for themselves. Rather, the clergy, that is the priests and the bishops, were to read the Bible and then tell the people what to do. But John Wycliffe disagreed. John Wycliffe wanted ordinary people to be able to hear the Bible in their own language. Here's how John Wycliffe put it. He said, Englishmen learn the law of Christ best in English. Moses heard God's law in his own tongue, so did Christ's apostles. But you see, many church leaders disagreed with this perspective, and they thought that the Bible was the property of the clergy of the church. Here's what one critic of John Wycliffe had to say. He said, Christ gave his gospel to the clergy and the learned doctors of the church so that they might give it to the lay people. But this master John Wycliffe, he's translated the gospel from Latin into the English. And Wycliffe, by thus translating the Bible, made it the property of the masses and common to all, even to women. 
And this was the perspective of many of the people in Wycliffe's day. But Wycliffe persisted in wanting to get the Bible out to ordinary people in England. Now, it's important for us to understand that Wycliffe did not do most of the translating in his particular Bible. Rather, he oversaw others translating it from the Latin Vulgate into Middle English. And the first translation of Wycliffe was really little more than a wooden, word-by-word -word translation of the Latin Vulgate. Now, in time, Wycliffe's New Testament developed into a much smoother translation of the scriptures. And Wycliffe sent people out all over England to be able to share the gospel and to share the text of this Bible with the ordinary people. And they were called Bible men. Now, later on, they ended up being called lollards, which was a derogatory term that means mumblers. And they developed small groups or cells in which they shared the scriptures and they memorized the text of the Bible. Now remember, Wycliffe's Bible couldn't be purchased by just anybody. And actually the cost of it would be about six months wages because at this time, this was before the invention of the printing press. And so these Bibles were copied by hand, page by page, letter by letter, by hand, and therefore were very expensive. And still, these texts spread all through England. In fact, today, 600 years later, about 170 portions of Wycliffe's New Testament, his Bible, survive still today. Now, more than once during this time, Wycliffe was charged with heresy. But each time, something happened in the midst of the trial, and he was not charged with heresy and convicted after all. Now, Wycliffe died of a stroke in 1384 while he was attending Mass, still officially in good standing with the church. But in 1408, it became illegal to produce or even to read a Bible in English. And so in 1415, John Wycliffe was put on trial again. Now, he couldn't show up to speak in his own defense because of the unfortunate fact he was dead. And so in 1415, he's put on trial, and this time he was convicted, even though he was already dead, and he was condemned. Now, also condemned at this time was a man named Jan Hus. Jan Hus was a priest from Bohemia who had been heavily influenced by Wycliffe's ideas and had preached the gospel throughout Bohemia. Now, a century later, after this time, in the early 1500s, there was a German monk, and he was rummaging around in the library of his monastery. And what he found there was a copy of Jan Hus's sermons, these sermons that had been so shaped by the theology and beliefs of John Wycliffe. And as this German monk read these sermons, he said this, For what cause did they burn so great a man? He explained the scriptures with so much gravity and skill. And that German monk who found a copy of Jan Hus's sermons was Martin Luther. Now, perhaps it shouldn't surprise us then that once Martin Luther was on the run from the church for his beliefs, one of the first things that Martin Luther did was to translate the Bible into German that the people in his country could understand so that they could hear the word of God for themselves. But between the days of Wycliffe in the late 1300s and Martin Luther in the early 1500s, something happened very, very important that made Martin Luther's translation far closer to the original text of the New Testament and Old Testament than Wycliffe's had been. Now remember, Wycliffe's Bible was not a translation from the original Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic text of the New Testament and the Old Testament. Wycliffe's translation was a translation of a translation. His source text was the Latin Vulgate. And so Wycliffe's translation, a translation of a translation from the Latin. But three very important things happened in the 1400s that set the stage to make the original text of the New Testament available much more widely than it had been for centuries. And the three developments were this. First and foremost, mass printing became possible. Remember that we talked about earlier how Johannes Gutenberg developed a movable metal type printing press that allowed for the mass production of documents. But the second thing that happened was that a Muslim army conquered Constantinople. In 1453, the Ottoman Turks took over the ancient city of Constantinople and it fell to them. And Christian scholars fled to the West, fled to Europe. And when they did, what many of them brought were their most precious possessions, which were Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. 
Now, there was also another thing that happened, a third one, which is that there was a major renaissance of interest in ancient languages that had developed in European universities. In fact, in 1458, European un universities began to offer classes in Greek for the first time. So these three different events, the invention of a movable metal-type printing press, the fall of Constantinople to the Muslims, and a renaissance of interest in ancient languages together enabled a Roman Catholic scholar named Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam to bring together and launch a project that would change the world. And it was the first published Greek New Testament. Now, oddly enough, Erasmus's primary purpose hadn't been to publish a Greek New Testament at all. In fact, here's what his primary purpose was, it seems, is that he wanted people to see his new version of the Latin Vulgate. And so he edited, pulled together a Greek New Testament to lay alongside the Latin Vulgate. And so he had the Greek in the left column of each page, and he had the Latin Vulgate in the right column of each page, because he wanted to, people to see how his version of the Latin Vulgate ran very close to the Greek original. And this 1516 edition that he called the Novum Instrumentum Omne, this 1516 edition was actually quite poorly edited. In fact, people have sometimes jokingly called it the most poorly edited book in the history of publishing. But he published it anyway. It was the first Greek New Testament ever to be published, and it was published in 1516. But despite all of its weaknesses, this edition of the Greek New Testament was the one that rocked Martin Luther's world. Because you see, Martin Luther was this monk who had been utterly wracked and torn by guilt and wondering how he could be made right with God. And he ran across in this Greek New Testament the verse Romans 1, 17, where it says that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And reading that text, Martin Luther realized this. He realized that the only way to be made right with God was by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, that there was no other way. And so in the midst of that, Erasmus's New Testament, despite any weaknesses it may have had, God used it to transform Martin Luther's life. But of course, Erasmus corrected and improved this Greek New Testament over five different editions, the third edition being one of the most important of these early editions of the Greek New Testament. Now, it was not without its flaws, even in its final form, Erasmus's Greek New Testament. Because you see, he only possessed, when he pulled this together, seven different Greek manuscripts. And his manuscript of Revelation even lacked the last part of Revelation. So the way he got his Greek text of Revelation in the last pages was to translate backwards, going from Latin backwards into Greek. And so his text, even despite these weaknesses, and despite the fact that the seven Greek manuscripts he had were not the oldest and were not the best Greek manuscripts, it was the only Greek New Testament that was available. And so it was widely used, and it was widely distributed, and it was widely copied. Some of the most widely used editions of Erasmus's Greek New Testament were the ones that were printed by a man named Etienne, or Stephanus, Robert Stephanus. And he published several editions of the Greek New Testament that were based on Erasmus's work. And the Stephanus Greek New Testament, a couple of editions of it, were the ones that were used by the translators of the King James Version several years later. It was the Stephanus Greek New Testament as well that introduced verse divisions into the Bible. You see, when Paul wrote his original letters and when the gospel writers wrote their gospels, there were no chapters and there were no verses. And chapters had been introduced several years earlier, but it was in the Stephanus Greek New Testament where verse divisions began to be introduced. Now, the entire line of Greek New Testaments that traces all the way back to Erasmus's 1516 edition are called the Textus Receptus. They became known as the Received Text, or Textus Receptus in Latin. And none of these was completely identical to any of the others, but all of them could be traced back to Erasmus's 1516 Greek New Testament. Now, the third edition of Erasmus's Greek New Testament, it's the one that was used by a man named William Tyndale to translate the scriptures into English for the first time from the original languages. William Tyndale was the first one to go back to the original Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and to translate the Bible from those languages into English. Now, it's 
almost impossible to overstate the importance of William Tyndale for the English Bible as well as for the English language, the importance of Tyndale in the history of the English Bible. In fact, he's often called the father of the English Bible. And if you read the Bible in English, you can thank William Tyndale at some level because his scholarship shaped almost every text that you read in the New Testament. Now, William Tyndale was one of the most brilliant scholars in 16th century England. By the time he graduated from Cambridge University, he was fluent in eight languages, including Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. When he began studying for his doctorate in theology, he was upset, chagrined, because of the fact that his degree in theology didn't include any study of the Bible. And so he began having Bible studies with some of his fellow students at the university. Now eventually, when William Tyndale graduated, he became a chaplain and a tutor for a wealthy family. And one evening, while he was eating dinner with this wealthy family, there was a visiting priest. And the visiting priest said this, ah, we're better off without God's law than we would be without the Pope's law. And when William Tyndale heard this, here's what he said back. He said, if God spares my life, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of scripture than you do. Tyndale's passion became for every person in England to be able to have access to the Bible in the English language. But his bishop that was over him refused to allow him to translate the Bible into English. And so William Tyndale went to Germany where he thought that he could translate the Bible in peace. And so in 1526, a printer in Germany produced 6,000 copies of Tyndale's New Testament in English. Now, when Tyndale's New Testaments were sent over to England, the, the bishops in England bought as many copies of them as they could at inflated prices and burned them. But William Tyndale wasn't upset by this. He said, that bishop will burn my New Testament and I am all the gladder. The overplus of the money shall make me more studious to correct the New Testament and so to imprint the same once again. And that's precisely what he did. The bishops bought the Bibles and they burned them and he used the money to be able to correct and to publish more of them and send them to England. And his revised version of his New Testament was absolutely a masterpiece. In that Tyndale even coined a lot of different words words that you and I use today without even thinking about it. He was the first one to come up with the word beautiful, for example. Uh, words like Passover and peacemaker and scapegoat, all of these were words that were coined by William Tyndale. Now, in the end, it wasn't his translation of the Bible that cost William Tyndale his life. It wasn't that at all. It was actually the many marriages of King Henry VIII. Because remember, the king during this era was King Henry VIII, and he's well known even today for his many wives. And Tyndale wrote a tract that denounced the way in which Henry VIII had disposed of his wife Catherine. And Tyndale then became a wanted man. In 1536, a false friend betrayed Tyndale to the king's soldiers, and William Tyndale was captured, he was strangled, and he was burned. Now, the actual charge against William Tyndale was a ridiculous charge. It was that he had made a corrupt translation of the Bible. In fact, William Tyndale hadn't made a corrupt translation of the Bible. He had made one of the finest translations of the Bible in all of history. And yet his last words were these, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And in the end, God answered his prayer. Well, a year or so after Tyndale's death, King Henry VIII approved the Matthews Bible, which was a completed edition of William Tyndale's work. And in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are the initials W.T. to show where this came from, that this was indeed a completed edition of the work of William Tyndale to get the Bible into the English language. Now, about a year after that, the king placed a great Bible, which was a revised edition of the Matthews Bible, which was a completion of Tyndale's translation in every church in England, every church. And so Tyndale's dream had been to make the Bible accessible to the plowboy, to everybody in England. And now, even if the boy at the plow couldn't afford his own copy of the Bible, he could go to any church in England and there was a Bible 
there for him to read. Now, Tyndale's translation influenced many, many later English translations. One of those was the Geneva Bible. Now, the Geneva Bible was sort of one of the first study Bibles. It had study notes that went in the margins to explain things, to help you understand better what was being said in the Bible. It was the Bible of William Shakespeare. It was the Bible that the pilgrims brought across the Atlantic to the American colonies in the 17th century. But probably Tyndale's greatest impact came through the King James Version of the Bible. Now, the King James Version began with a failed meeting between the English Puritans and their kings. So let's set the stage in the early 1600s. In 1603, Queen Elizabeth died, and James left Edinburgh and headed south to London for his coronation as the king. And on the way, he received a petition. It was called the Millenary Petition. And more than a thousand English pastors had signed this, and it was the Puritans' request for reform in the Church of England. Well, King James called for a conference at Hampton Court. Hampton Court is this beautiful thousand-room brick palace in this reddish rose brick that had been built almost a century earlier. And in January of 1604, the Puritans presented their requests to King James. Now, they had a whole lot of different requests that they made. One of them was for simpler Sunday worship in the Book of Common Prayer. And they said, we want the, the longsomeness of the service to be abridged with no popish opinion any more taught. There are all sorts of things that they asked for, and almost everything that they asked for ended up being rejected. But in the end, even though he rejected almost all of their requests, King James did give them one thing that they asked for. One of the Puritans asked for a new translation of the Bible. Now, the reason King James jumped on that is because he despised the Geneva Bible. And the reason he did is because, in his own words, those notes in the Bible, that Geneva Bible, according to him, are very partial, savoring too much of dangerous and seditious conceits. So King James called for a translation without any theological or political notes in the margins. And in fact, in his orders for the King James Version, what became the King James Version, he specifically stated that there would be no marginal notes except those that were necessary to explain the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic text. Now, translation on this new version began later on that very same year. There were 47 scholars that were brought together from both Puritans and from those who supported the Church of England as it was. And they were organized into six different teams. There were three Old Testament teams, two New Testament teams, and one team that translated the Apocrypha, those additional books that we talked about earlier. Now those were put in a separate section of this new Bible, which was finished in 1609. And so it was in 1609 that they completed, that they reviewed all of their different translations. And then in 1611, the first edition of the authorized version, or as it became known later, the King James Version, rolled off the printing presses in 1611. Now here's what's interesting when we look at the King James Version and at Tyndale's translations. What we find is that at least 70% of Tyndale's translations end up coming over into the King James Version of the Bible. So when you read the King James Version, you are even then indebted to a man who died long before the King James Version was translated, William Tyndale. Now, it took several years for this new version, the King James Version, to catch on because many people still preferred the Geneva Bible. But once the King James Version caught on, it became the standard translation for English-speaking people for well over 250 years. Now, of course, there were other English translations as well. There had been, for example, the reims Douay Bible, which was an English version of the Bible for Roman Catholics that had been translated from the Latin Vulgate. And the King James Version itself was revised several times over the years. And in fact, the version that we use today is from the 1769 Oxford revision of the King James Version. Now, in the 1700s, as well as the 1800s, many older manuscripts were discovered than the ones Erasmus had used when he brought together his Greek New Testament. Remember, Erasmus only had about seven Greek manuscripts when he brought together his Greek New Testament. But many others that were discovered were much older than the ones that Erasmus had had, and probably much more accurate than the ones that Erasmus had been able to collate together in his Greek New Testament. 
And so in the year 1870, the Church of England commissioned a new translation of the Bible that would take advantage of many of these new manuscripts and new discoveries about the Hebrew language. And in 1885, that translation was completed and became known as the English Revised Version of the Bible. It was published a few years later in 1901 in the United States as the American Standard Version of the Bible. Now, since that time, more than 900 translations of the Bible or parts of the Bible have been made in the English language. But even as we, as English-speaking people, have hundreds of translations available to us in our language. There are 180 million people around the world who have no part of the scriptures available to them in their own language. Right now, even as we speak, there are at least 1,860 languages that need translation of the Bible done in those languages. And so just as William Tyndale prayed, Lord, open the King of England's eyes, Perhaps our prayer should be today, Lord, open our eyes to the need around us so that we train translators and we send translators and so that we provide for the world the word of God. It always amazes me how God gets his plan done uh, despite us. <laughs> uh, flawed human beings, broken human beings, uh, kings, priests. Uh, and, and it's amazing that priests at one time and monks at one time actually burned Bibles. They didn't want the Bibles to get into the hands of the masses. Uh, especially women. I, I, I laugh every time I hear that quote that talks about, uh, wow, they, you know, Tyndale wanted the Bible even in the hands of women. Oh my gosh, it's, it's gotten that bad. Uh, but it, it's just amazing how God's plan goes forward despite us. And I think that speaks to the power of God and his plan going forward. And it goes to his love for us in that he can, he can reach us with his word uh, despite the hundreds of years of, of transmission of, of the Bible. Now, what I'm gonna do is uh, if you'll take a look at your screen, you will see, as soon as I bring it up, um, three questions. And these are the main points of that particular video of, of our learning for today. Uh, when did mass printing Bibles begin? That's the first question. Number two, who is known as the father of the English Bible? And then number three, what key events of the 1400s led to, the, uh, to make the Greek New Testament very widely available? So go ahead and take a look at those three questions, answer them, uh, and make sure to hit the submit button. The first one, uh, has only one right answer. Number two has one right answer. And number three has three right answers. So number three, you can choose more than one. And there are three right answers for number three. If you have a question, go ahead and um, uh, pipe up, take yourself off of mute and feel, feel free to ask a question. There we go. So our recording audience can can hear what we're, what's going on. The first question, when did mass printing of Bibles begin? The correct answer is, it looks like most people got it, after 1400 AD. Actually, I don't like the, the way that uh, answer is phrased, because after 1400 AD also includes around 1750. Uh, so if you want to be technical, um, there's some overlap there, but the correct answer is actually in around 1450, 1455. There's some debate, but around the middle of the 1400s, Johannes Gutenberg uh, invented the first movable type metal uh, printing press. And the Bible, the Holy Bible was one of the first books ever printed. So the correct answer, most people uh, got right. Hey, give yourself a, give yourself a hand. Most people, most of the group. Number two, who is known as the father of the English Bible? And as you heard the comments, 
yes, there's actually two correct answers. William Tyndale is definitely, um, most scholars believe that he is the father of the English Bible. And you heard, uh, you heard uh, our lecturer, uh, Dr. Jones, actually say he's the father of the English Bible. However, there are some scholars who believe that John Wycliffe uh, or Wycliffe should be given that honor uh, because he contributed a lot uh, to the English Bible. He came up with the first. He, he, came, he actually did the first translation into English. It was a translation of a translation. However, it was a translation into the English. And back to William Tyndale, because of his many accomplishments, because of this, his passion, because of his many revisions, and him giving his life uh, the way he did for the English Bible, uh, most scholars believe it is William Tyndale. So if you have William Tyndale, you're correct. If you have John Wycliffe, you are also correct. One of those two, either one of those two is okay. Uh, Johannes Gutenberg is not correct because he was the inventor of the printing press, but he's not considered the father of the English Bible. So congratulations to most of you. Give yourself a, give yourself a hand. Very good. Group is doing well. The last question. What key events of the 1400s AD led to make the Greek New Testament very widely available? If you look in your participant guide, and this is, by the way, open notes polling, uh, on page uh, 78, you can see them three in the second point in number two. You can see the three key events in the in the 1400s. One of them, one of them was the fall of Constantinople. So if you answer fall of Constantinople in 1453, that is correct. Another key event of the 1400s was the Gutenberg printing press, and most people. It, like answered that, 53% of us, which is, uh, which is very good. And the third key event was the increase in interest in ancient languages in European right. universities. That was the third key event. So if you answered the fall of Constantinople or the Gutenberg printing press or increase in interest in ancient languages in European universities. You can give yourself a hand. Yay, you can give yourself a hand. You can do it digitally, like I just did, or you can give yourself a hand, but very good. As a group, did pretty well. Those are the key points of uh, our session for, for this evening. Now, for, let, me, let me remind you that we do have some uh, personal study. Uh, our daily activities for this week begin on page 85. You can turn to page 85 in your participant guide. And there's some, there's some reading and there's some what I call response. There's some places where you're asked a question. You can go ahead and write your responses. Uh, and let me take this opportunity just for, for a minute to encourage you to go ahead and do those daily activities. I know things come up. Uh, sometimes you're not able to, uh, to do them on, on certain days. But if you just spend a few minutes each day doing that, I think it'll be well worth it. The videos that we have, I think, are great. I think Dr. Jones does a great uh, job. Uh, I try to emphasize some things and we do some polling. And sometimes we have discussions. But it really is the personal study that helps to deepen your understanding, to, to deepen your, your uh, learning of this uh, information. So I think, I think it's, it's really important for you to go ahead and try to, try to carve out some time each day, whether it's first thing in the morning, maybe it's uh, at night after dinner, uh, sometimes it's during lunch, whatever's a good time for you, go ahead and do that. So let me see if I can just wrap up the whole thing uh, and put a bow around it. Uh, one of the things that I hope you got out of this, one of the key things, Dr. Jones mentioned this near the end, is the importance of that every person in every language needs a Bible 
that they can understand so we can be doers of the word. That's very, very important. So when you're reading, you're going to get some more information on translators, on uh, how to pray for the translators. Maybe you want to even do some research and cheerfully give to uh, some of the organizations that do translation work. During seminary, when I was doing my master's work in, in New Testament, I had a chance to get to know two or three, uh, it was actually two uh, translators. They were taking master's level um, seminary with me. And they are actually being trained and they're gonna be deployed around the globe. I think one was going to uh, Eastern Europe. The other one was going to India, and they're actually going to take dialects of some obscure languages and translate from the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek and translate the Bible into their native uh, language. I was just so impressed with them. They're very smart people, very diligent. Uh, and so pray about how you can help uh, provide a Bible that people can understand in their own language. The second thing that I hope you understand is the contributions of people like John uh, Wycliffe and people like Erasmus and William Tyndale. And in a lot of cases, in most cases, they gave their life so that we could uh, have an English Bible. They had a lot of opposition. Um, the devil was definitely against having the English language uh, for English people. And he was against having German Bibles for Germans also. But, the, you know, the devil does not want people to read the Bible. The devil does not want you to understand the Bible. And so please um, uh, be grateful for people like John Wycliffe and Erasmus and William Tyndale. Also realize that it's amazing that God uses free will people. We are free will people. We are broken people uh, to advance his, his plan. And part of his plan is getting the Bible into people's hands. Uh, even look at the three key events of the 1400s. Those three events came together at the right time to make some things happen for Erasmus to, to get uh, a translation together that influenced uh, generation. So it, it, it's amazing. And also understand the creation of the King James Bible. Uh, understand how, I hope you understand better how it came to be and some of the opposition to it. As popular as the King James Bible is today, when it was first introduced, it wasn't very popular. Uh, it, it came, it, there were a lot of obstacles to overcome. But now we have it, and it's one of the most uh, popular translations. So any, um, let me go ahead and open it up to you. Uh, go ahead and take yourself off of mute. Any questions or comments over anything that we've uh, talked about today? Any questions or comments? All right. Well, let me just say this before we say goodbye to our recording uh, audience. Uh, do, your, do your personal study. And uh, also, let me just give you a, a glimpse of what's coming up in the next few weeks. Many of you saw the email. I hope all of you saw the email that talked about the story. Our next series starting August the 25th is the story. Thank you for those that have already registered for the story. I just wanna make sure that you, uh, that I have enough books. Uh, you'll need a uh, story book, the story book, and you'll also need a study guide. The story book has not changed. They've done some reprints, uh, but it, it is essentially the same. However, the participant guide or the study guide has changed. So if you already have a participant guide from back in 2016 when we first did it, you need to pick up another study guide. 
uh, it has changed that much. So make sure it will be available. I think it's on August the 15th. I think I put it out that those books will be available. But please go ahead and register so I can get a feel for the numbers and make sure that we have enough uh, books for everyone. So go ahead and do that. It only takes a few minutes. There are many, many ways that you can register. Uh, you can do it online. There's a paper here at the church. You can do it by email. You can give plenty of ways to go ahead and register. So go ahead and do that. Next week, we are going to talk about translation. That's all we're going to talk about, the many translations, why there's so many trans English translations, uh, the advantages and maybe uh, disadvantages of some of the major translations. And I'll answer the question that a lot of people ask me, what is the best translation? So if you want to find out what the best translation is and whether, you know, you can kind of compare it to yours, then uh, then come come back next week and find out. Last call for any questions or comments. All right, our live audience, uh, hold on for just a second. Let me say goodbye to our recording audience. Thank you so much for uh, playing this recording. If you like it, give us uh, give us a thumbs up and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>